Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwood. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, in for Francine. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Debt ceiling impasse. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says there's still no deal to avert a U.S. default. A top Republican aide adds that no meetings are planned. Inflation nation UK CPI comes in hot, with core prices rising at the fastest pace in more than 30 years. Traders add to BOE rate hike bets. The pound pairs gains. Plus, it is day two at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. We're going to be speaking to global entrepreneur and former SoftBank executive Marcelo Clare and Sebastian Bazin, the chair and CEO of Hospitality Group Accor this hour. For some breaking lines on the IFO business survey out of Germany, it comes in lower than expectations, 91.7. The estimate had been for 93. That is some disappointing data after we got PMIs in Germany yesterday that did show we're still not quite at that recovery. Some of the data came in better, but again, we're still looking at manufacturing weeks. So the business survey coming in worse than expected. When it comes to these markets overall, though, it is UK inflation which has rocked them. Let me show you what's going on because we are looking at equities that are sinking ever lower. It potentially is that tension of inflation. S&P 500 futures, they were higher to start the, uh, the session, the future session. Now those are down a third of a percent. Look at what's happening in the two-year yield. The front end of the gilt curve is getting hammered this morning. Again, inflation coming in higher than every single expectation. It's not just about energy. Fears of this being entrenched. Look out for 4.67%. That is the word from Othella over at Saxo Bank, who says that is the level where we need to be worried that potentially the BOE needs to step in. Meanwhile, sterling can't hold on to its gains. It's that Fear of the EM-type dynamic where higher yields means a lower, a weaker currency. Read across the board when it comes to the European equity trading. That is, map markets go on your terminal. Red basically everywhere. So, yes, UK bonds plunged across the curve, especially in the front end, after inflation data from April exceeded all estimates. It's prompted traders to ramp up bets on the Bank of England's peak interest rate. Joining me now is Bloomberg Markets Managing Editor Christine Aquino. Uh, Christine, is this uh, LDI redux? Is that how bad the sell-off seems to be this morning? Well, Danny, we're certainly getting to levels that we last saw during that whole fiasco uh, that will forever mark Liz Truss's administration. So it is quite worrying this morning. But, you know, I think it is very much squarely an economic reaction to the day that we saw this morning, uh, primarily that inflation shock, even though that number, the nominal rate of inflation, did fall back down, uh, as, as was expected. It still exceeded, as you mentioned, all the expectations, uh, again, proving that we've just completely underestimated the level of inflation in this country. And, and it does go beyond energy, right? Because it was the headline figure that, that was troubling. And so, I mean, what does that mean for a BOE at this point? A BOE where an Andrew Bailey at the start of this year said... Inflation looks like it might be starting to turn a corner. Absolutely, Danny. I mean, it definitely doesn't mean great things for the BOE. Their credibility was already being questioned, especially after they changed their economic forecast to something slightly more rosy um, at the, the latest Bank of England meeting and then get hit again by an inflation shock. We've, they have have been repeatedly been surprised just by how persistent inflation has been, and today has been no exception. And so even yesterday, you know, when Andrew Bailey spoke uh, to, to members of parliament, he did signal that the BOE was perhaps slow on the uptake in reacting to inflation, and today's numbers really just drives home that point. i got to say, there's got to be some irony with today the RBNZ saying mission accomplished, not those words exactly, but saying that they're going to pause. So is the UK just, not pause, sorry, they're going to finish and potentially even cut next year. Does the UK increasingly look more like an outlier in terms of not being able to get a grip on inflation? Well, it's certainly an outlier in terms of that nominal rate, right? It is the highest among uh, major uh, economies, certainly higher than what we've seen in the US and the euro area. And again, like that contrast between that high level of inflation and Bank of England policymakers repeatedly signaling prior to this number that 
that, oh, they may be nearing the end of their rate hiking cycle, only to be repeatedly proven wrong uh, yet again by the data. And so it certainly is an outlier in terms of just kind of that messaging gap uh, that we've heard from the BOE versus what we've seen in the hard data. Well, what do you make of cable at the moment? It did spike higher initially on that inflation report, but basically gave up all the gains. Yeah, very interesting dynamic in cable. I mean, in theory, right, more rate hikes uh, should mean a stronger currency. But I think traders are now kind of trying to weigh up the implications of more rate hikes, especially when it comes to the economic impact. I mean, we know what we've seen from the Fed's experience uh, that eventually when it gets to a certain level, uh, markets will start pricing in uh, potential recessions or at the very least an economic slowdown. And I think that is the dynamic that we're seeing in a pound at the moment. Uh, gains in the short term because of those rate hike bets, but longer term pain because of the uh, potential economic slowdown as a result. Step, stepping back a bit in, into risk markets, yesterday when there were, again, more concerns about debt ceiling drama, U.S. stocks sell off more than 1%. We get these U.K. inflation numbers. European stocks sell off more than 1%. How fragile is sentiment right now? Oh, very fragile, Danny. I mean, just looking at uh, the volatility that we've seen, we've been swinging from gains to losses depending on the headlines. There is a lot of that at the moment, I think, that, that sort of headline trading feeling. Uh, I think just because uh, there's really not kind of like one single catalyst that's moving global markets at the moment. I mean, as you mentioned, there are different narratives depending on which region that you, you look at and so uh, and, and all of that can kind of play out very differently um, and go in all sorts of directions and so I think there's a lot of catalysts that markets are trying to digest right now uh, we're also heading into summer markets which tend to be thinner and so a combination of that really could make for quite a volatile summer coming up yeah if liquidity wasn't bad enough Sp speaking of volatility just want to end on this point Christine because it was driving the markets before the UK drama um, the debt ceiling debate. You have Republicans saying that potentially June 1st, they're questioning whether that's actually the X date. Does it look like markets are finally waking up and paying more attention to the likelihood we might get a 2011 type event where we just come right up to that deadline and it causes still a sell-off even though an agreement is reached? Yeah, it certainly does feel that that ceiling topic is more squarely on the market's radar. I wouldn't say that it's the only thing under radar, but definitely as we approach that X date, as highlighted by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, it feels like that is the case. And, you know, we're already seeing a move away from that duration trade. That's definitely not something you want to be in, especially when you're considering the prospect of a U.S. default, however unlikely, and, and seeing more movement into those short-term Treasury bills as a potential, uh, shall we say, winner of of this sort of debt ceiling debacle. Yeah, exactly what we were just looking at with those chart, those T-bill yields uh, moving up above 6% for some of those June dates. Christine, thanks as always for joining us. That's Bloomberg Markets Managing Editor Christine Aquino. Now, coming up, Francine Lacroix is live in Doha, hence why you're seeing me instead of her at this moment. She's going to be speaking exclusively to the IMS Managing Director, plus the Qatari and Saudi Finance Ministers this hour. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Let's get to your first word news. With that is Alex Morgan. Alex. Danny, good morning. Well, Bloomberg has learned that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will announce his 2024 presidential campaign in a Twitter spaces as a live stream alongside Elon Musk. Sources say DeSantis will speak with Musk at 6 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, and the campaign will release a launch video. Well, that announcement will set up a confrontation with the Republican frontrunner Donald Trump for the party's nomination. A British regulator said five banks colluded to swap information on UK bonds. Deutsche Bank, Citigroup, HSBC, Morgan Stanley and Royal Bank of Canada shared sensitive information between 2009 and 2013. That's according to the Competition and Markets Authority's provisional findings. Well, fines could be issued for some of the lenders. Morgan Stanley said it's cooperating with the probe, but will contest those allegations. The four other banks didn't immediately respond to requests for comments. China's new ambassador to the US has acknowledged challenges in the relations between Beijing and Washington as he arrived to take up his post. Xi Feng says he intends to challenge ex uh, to, to engage extensively with the Americans and properly handle sensitive challenges, including over Taiwan. Well, Xi had served in several roles uh, at the embassy in Washington, 
and was Beijing's top representative in Hong Kong. At present, uh, Sino-U.S. relations is facing serious difficulties and challenges. We hope that the United States will work together with China to increase dialogue, to manage differences, and also to expand our cooperation so that our relationship will be back to the right track. And Netflix is bringing its account sharing crackdown to the US. It's alerted customers that they must pay an extra $8 a month if they want to share their passwords with people outside of their household. Netflix began its password sharing crackdown last year as part of a strategy to generate more revenue from its users. That is global news powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Alex Morgan and this is Bloomberg. Danny. Alex, thank you so much. I fear I still use my parents' Netflix account, so I, for one, am worried about that. Anyway, something many more people are worried about. The UK's inflation rate has remained much stronger than expected, with the fastest increase in services and core prices in more than three decades. The figures have fueled a flurry of bets on more Bank of England interest rate rises and a sell-off on the front end. Two-year UK gilts now uh, up more than 26 basis points. Let's get to our Bloomberg UK correspondent, Lizzie Burden. Uh, Lizzie, it seems like the market isn't so pleased with this data. Just, just what did we see exactly in it? Well, yeah, it's bad news for the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, whose number one priority is halving inflation by the end of the year. More importantly, it's bad news for households and it's bad news for the Bank of England. Doesn't look like they can take their foot off the gas. So we are in single digits, but this headline print is way above economists' expectations, including the Bank of England. So it came in at 8.7%. The BOE had seen 8.4%. Um, and it points to problems with the Bank of England's modelling, which the chief economist Hugh Pill himself pointed to in Parliament yesterday. And the governor, Andrew Bailey, said, you know, there's a problem that they saw inflation uh, falling almost in the same way that it rose. It has not. If you break it down, um, a lot of the reason inflation has fallen is because of base effects. So that 50%, nearly 50% rise in energy bills that we saw last year has fallen out in the annual comparison. But on the other side, food price inflation is still near historic highs, even if it's ticked down. So that's really going to hurt the poorest Brits. And then if you strip out energy, strip out food and just focus on core inflation, that was expected to hold steady, but actually it rose. Uh, it's risen uh, to, from 6.2% to 6.8%. And that points to the stickiness of this inflation, which is what the Monetary Policy Committee will be really concerned about. And this is why traders have increased their bets for BOE peak rates from 5% to 5.5% now. And it would be significant, wouldn't it, if the Bank of England breached that 5 percent mark because that's what they've warned about households seeing as um, a dangerous level. Yes I mean the, the point you make about forecasts is so great I know the BOE got a lot of ridicule in some of the charts they put out just the wide bands where they see GDP. Speaking of growth speaking of business you also spoke to UK shadow chancellor Rachel Reeves yesterday. Um, what were some of your main takeaways from that conversation? Yeah, I mean, the polls suggest that this is Britain's chancellor in waiting. So really significant that she's setting out Labour's economic plan today in the US. We got to catch up with her for the UK Politics podcast. She spoke to Caroline Hepker and me. And uh, what she was saying was that she wants to go for secure economics. Well, what's that? That is Labour's idea of... Um, being the, trying to be the party of business through a more interventionist, activist state approach, which contrasts with um, Rishi Sunak's response to Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. He has warned about triggering off a race in state subsidies. Uh, but this seems a bit more in line with Bidenomics. She wants to boost growth in, for example, life sciences, green energy. Um, she also... It's significant that she's announcing this in the US, wants more cooperation with international partners. She says that Britain's become too closed off after Brexit. So we asked, would you rejoin the single market and the customs union? The answer is still a clear no from Labour. What she wants to do is try to uh, reduce some of the trade barriers. So, for example, uh, more mutual recognition of professional qualifications. That may, to many, seem like tinkering around the edges at a time when Britain is clearly desperate.
for economic growth. Right. And of course, we can listen to the full interview on the podcast. Remind me of the name where folks can find it. UK Politics Podcast. It's out this afternoon. Love it. Looking forward to that. Lizzie, thank Thanks, you Connie. so much. That is Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. And we, of course, cover all things UK every week on Thursday at 9.30 a.m. London time in our half hour special. So that's tomorrow. Won't you listen to that? Now, coming up, much more from the Qatar Economic Forum. We're going to hear from Marcelo Clare, the founder of global investment firm Clare Group, as well as Sebastian Bazin, the chair and CEO of hospitality group Accor. This is Bloomberg. Seeing the power of uh, what the internet did uh, and what communications and informa information technologies did to our economy, I think this is even more profound than that. And it's at a global scale uh, to transform an energy system that is huge, incumbent, uh, uh, and uh, uh, but and it's got to happen fast if, if we're going to uh, have a uh, a planet that's livable and, and have a, uh, a secure future for our children and grandchildren. That was John Podesta, senior uh, White, ha White House senior advisor, rather, who features in the first episode of the new series of Leaders with Lockwa Goes Green. Standard Charter CEO Bill Winters says he's heard reassuring comments from Washington on resolving the debt ceiling tug of war. He spoke to Francine in Doha. Of course, we're worried about the debt ceiling, but I heard the reassuring comments both from uh, from President Biden and Speaker McCarthy yesterday. I, I have to think these guys know uh, what they're playing with, so I, I'm okay on that. Uh, I think it's the structural uh, resistance of inflation to come back down. That's the biggest concern. Not right at this moment, but just as that plays out over time, what's economic growth look like? I, I've been very impressed by the resilience in the U.S., in Europe, and of course this region, the Middle East, is booming. Asia is booming. Yeah. India is booming despite higher interest rates. So I think you'll okay. Bill, if you look at the debt ceiling, even if we have a resolution, are we playing with fire? Does it actually put the U.S. as a reserve currency, as like, you know, leader of the free world at risk? Look, I mean, we've been, the, the politicians in Washington have been playing with the debt ceiling for decades. And you know, so far, there's not been an accident. Of course, every time it happens, we wonder, you know, given how crazy yeah. the politics is in the U.S. right now, is this going to be the time that, but the fact is, the Treasury, the Treasury markets are behaving well credit markets are behaving well. So the market is not pricing in a bad outcome here. There's a lot of money in the Middle East. Do you think they're after a bank like yours? Uh, look, I think everybody in the world would love to own a piece of Standard Charter Bank because it's a strong bank. We're doing well. We've got this super interesting footprint across Asia, Middle East, and Africa. So you're a takeover target. And we're target. cheap. So you're and we're a takeover cheap. target. Like I say, if somebody wants to, to, to come and say, we can add more value to this bank than what you're doing today, where you're growing it at, at uh, double-digit growth rates, profits at you know, substantially higher. You can have an idea on how to do something better. Please let us know. We'll come in. Uh, but is there? You know, the, the fact is we're a global bank today. We're adequately scaled for the environment. We're growing quite nicely. That's all I'm focused on. Okay. If you look at regulators um, in, you know, in the UK and elsewhere, would they be ready for takeover of a large systemic bank by you know, Middle Eastern money? Well, I noticed that there was a takeover of a large systemic bank in Switzerland a few weeks back, and it happened in a weekend. So I guess that means that's in, the, domestic. in the right, well, <laughs> in the right circumstance, uh, you know, regulators can get things going. Uh, I think the uh, it, it's very impressive to see uh, how the, the the various investors in the Gulf. Uh, just, we're sitting here in Qatar today. I just uh, had a panel discussion with with the head of the, the, the Qatar Investment Authority. This is a very impressive investor right? with, with, a, with a truly global perspective, a lot of experience investing. And I, I think these, the, the various countries in the Gulf, of course, are accumulating savings right now, and they're diversifying their economy. So that's why we're here. That's why we're investing so much capital into the Middle East, because we see these huge opportunities to connect that, that capital with all the opportunities in Asia and vice versa. So do you need to, to have a bank to do that? Yeah. No, you need to have a bank like us that's prepared to, to, to play that bridging role. Standard Charter CEO Bill Winter speaking to Bloomberg at the Qatar Economic Forum. The market at the moment still reeling from inflation numbers in the UK that were above all the analysts' estimates. That showed it's not just energy, it is core. 
it is sticky, sticky inflation. This is what it looks like over the two days. You can see that jump at the open, a gain of more than 30 basis points in the front end of the curve. I was talking to Athea Spinoza over at Saxo Bank earlier who said 4.67. That is the level to watch out for when the BOE starts to get worried, when it looks something more like an LDI crisis. Elsewhere, you are still seeing strength in sterling. It did jump, but it's come back in. It is weakness across stocks, partially in reaction to these inflation figures. You also had the dampening effect of concerns over the debt ceiling agreement in the U.S., whether we would actually get one, and we continue to see weakness in European luxury stocks. Coming up, we are back at the Qatar Economic Forum. We're going to be hearing from the founder of Global Investment Group, Clare Group, as well as the chair and CEO of Hospitality Group Accor. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Let's take you live now to the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha, where Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua is hosting a special panel discussion with Kristalina Georgieva, the managing director of the IMF, as well as the Qatari and Saudi finance ministers. We are very proud of it in the region, as much as I'm sure the Qataris are. I can tell you we are very proud of how um, they organized it and showcased the capabilities of, of Qatar and the region. Um, going back to your question, I think this region, uh, and we've said this before, and I'm not trying to sell, although I am to some extent selling, um, this region is a very bright spot mm -hmm. in a very difficult world today and this did not come by coincidence really i mean it it came through a very strong rigorous execution of long-term uh, coordinated well aligned plans um, to diversify the economy to make sure that your people are ready so you are training your education system is up to speed with what's happening in the world. You are investing in technologies, you are investing in infrastructure, you are mm -hmm. making sure that you think through mm -hmm. what would make you more competitive in the global stage and set these policies. I'm sure the same across. Um, what distinguished this region, and I'll cover Saudi very quickly, is first of all, you are in a very unique location. You know, in the middle of cross-trade routes, um, where you are connecting Asia with Africa, with mm -hmm. Europe, that gives you a competitive advantage. And you are actually seeing it in, in um, the number of ports that on the top 10 worldwide uh, are actually in the Gulf region. King Abdullah uh, Economic City Port is actually number one in 22 by the World Bank ranking on um, uh, container ports um, and the same actually in multiple ports in the region. This region have possibly the busiest, one of the busiest airports uh, worldwide in international passenger traffic. Um, so this is an investment. This is long term plans mm -hmm. being executed. Um, you could see a lot of efforts in investing in infrastructure and these also uh, long-term uh, plans and we are not keeping it um, to ourselves actually we are trying to make sure that the, the wider region not only the gcc but the wider region benefits and see a, a role model in, in the countries of the region in terms of reform in terms of taking long-term approach to their diversification drive in terms of actually looking at their people and their prosperity. Saudi, and I'll close. 
Uh, Bloomberg's Francine Locke were there Saudi in conversation with Kristalina Georgieva, the managing director of the IMF, as well as the Qatari and Saudi finance ministers. You can watch more of that conversation by heading to LiveGo under Bloomberg Terminal. All right, let's take you to elsewhere at the Qatar Economic Forum, where political and business leaders are discussing the latest economic trends. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde is also there, and she's joined by a global entrepreneur and former SoftBank executive. Caroline. Marcelo Clare is with me, of course, Danny, founder and CEO of the Global Investment Fund, Clare Group. Of course, family office, billions under management, looking to expand. But what's so fascinating is you're stuck here right now in the Middle East, but really focused on Latin America, but bringing money, international money, into Latin America. You've, well, you're now an executive with Sheen, one of the most fast-growing well, fashion companies why Latin America? What are the growth opportunities there? What do you do to convince the money? So I always wanted to go back. I've been very lucky, as you know, to run several global companies through my tenure at SoftBank and others. And I always had a special piece, a special part of my heart being Latin America since I'm from Bolivia. And the more I've traveled in the region, what I've learned is that Latin America is one of those few spots where I believe opportunities are greater than capital that's available today. So therefore, I look at a region where, you know, because of what is going on in the geopolitical world, there is a lot of nearshoring or offshoring factors that are moving to Latin America, and you're having an investment boom in places like Mexico, where I don't think we would ever dream to have semiconductor being made in Mexico, electric cars being made in Mexico, and so on. So, you know, from that part. And then secondly, commodities play a very part of a very important part of the economy going forward, mm. especially as we start to electrify the world. And when you look at countries like Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile, two-thirds of the world's lithium sits there. Most of the copper in the world is being mined in basically Latin America. So I look at a combination of commodities, a young and thriving workforce, plus nearshoring, you know, makes it, I think, an ideal place where opportunities will be great. And I've decided to dedicate the next 10 years of my life to putting everything I've learned to Latin America. Okay, so let's talk about, first and foremost, the opportunities there. You're expanding, for example, manufacturing for Sheen in Brazil. 100 factories, I think it is already. You're looking at Mexico as well. How do you think about, you know, there are some ethical concerns around the ways in which some of these clothing were manufactured. You've done a tour of Sheen's yes. manufacturing. You're, you feel comfortable with that? How do you want to see that growth be executed in okay. Brazil and Mexico? So the first investment after I, I've left SoftBank, my first family office investment was in a company that I've always been fascinating, and that's Sheen. And what makes Sheen different than any other company in the world, the ability to design, manufacture, and ship product in less than seven days. Nobody else can do that. It takes traditional fashion companies three, six, nine months to come up with new products. So I was fascinating by that. And the fact that there's no waste because everything is manufactured on demand. So that was one. But before I wanted, before I invested and before I took an active role in the company, I decided to go to China and go visit the manufacturing facilities and, I, and go visit their employees, go visit, really get a sense as an operator that I am, get a sense of how, does, how can this be possible? How can you design and manufacture so fast? And I came back extremely happy with the quality of the workforce, with the quality of the factories and with you know, one of these companies that's in high growth mode, full of young and energized employees. And this is why today this is one of the fastest growing companies in the world. And one that could go public as and when the markets start to be more well, opportune for that. Do you have a timing, a sense of when you think companies will start to be able to become publicly traded companies and you can really make the most of some of the private money you've already put in? Yeah, well, as you know, nobody can comment on the status of public markets or when and if Shin will go public. But what I can tell you is, having been around many companies throughout my career, this is one of the most fascinating companies that I have ever been part of. And this is why I've decided to be part of the executive team of the company and a special focus on Latin America. It's probably one of the fastest growing regions for them in markets like Brazil and Mexico, where the demand for a great product at a great price with a large selection is such an important piece. So super excited to be part of Shein and super excited to be part of growth and probably one of the most disruptive companies that exist today. You've already mentioned electric vehicles as well and some of the infrastructure around that. You must be thinking about artificial intelligence. How are you thinking about the companies you're already working with, adopting that, using it, becoming more productive, or indeed investment opportunities there? Yes, yeah, so, you know, we've been big fans of the AI world since our tenure in SoftBank. We made it a, you know, the entire uh, investment thesis behind all the investment we did at SoftBank was based on 
AI companies are going to tra that are going to disrupt traditional business model. Well, I think AI is now in our hands. I mean, we see it all today. You can have ChatGPT or you can have Gen AI in your iPhone or in different phones, and people are starting to use it for the first time. The other day, I was I was shocked, and I would not. I have six children. I would not tell you which one, but I got a call from the from the teacher telling me that my one of my daughters was using ChatGPT to basically get an extra help on their homework. And as a father, I had no, first it was a shocking moment because this has arrived to our family, to our house and all that. But I didn't know whether to be upset at my children for, for getting that help or actually being proud for enabling technology. I think AI is here to stay. I think we're going to see every single business model industry vertical disrupted through the use of AI. And this is not something that's going to happen in the far future. This is happening now. It's happening today. And all you have to do is, you know, use ChatGPT to understand the power, what is happening in content, you know, how are our elections going to be affected. There's so many fascinating things that are going to happen through the true introduction of AI into every single vertical. So we look at the next five years as the years where you should invest in AI companies. Startups, not just, the, it's not all going to be dominated by the big players such as OpenAI, them teaming with Microsoft or indeed a Google's bar. I mean, those are the foundational layer that are necessary, but the beautiful thing is disruption is going to happen in the application level, meaning you have so many different startups that are going to choose a specific verticals, a specific workflows to basically disrupt what happens there. Obviously, they're all going to have to be connected to one of the big foundational layer, but this is to me the internet at an exponential phase. I mean, when have we seen any application have a million customers in five days? That had never happened before. And the more you use it, the more it becomes part of your everyday life. A lot of VCs I speak to want to talk about artificial intelligence because it's basically a silver lining amid some economic clouds right now. You, I know you can't speak much about the work at SoftBank and Vision Fund, but ultimately it was an area that they went bigger to startups, but we've seen valuations hit hard, unsurprisingly, by the economy we're in. Do you think we're at the end point now? Are we at the, have we now seen valuations become at the level they need to be to vindicate the growth that we're seeing in these companies? Or is there more to go? Valuations are an indication of time, and I think people are confused between innovation, disruption, technology, and valuation. If we focus on valuations, the reason why valuations were so high because there was an unlimited amount of capital that was free. So when you have so much capital, there's a problem of quantity of capital. So obviously, capital is going to be deployed at an accelerated pace. And those companies, so therefore valuations are going to be high because it was a very competitive market. As interest rates rose, you know, to, to where the levels that were today, those companies are going to generate less cash flow in the future, and therefore, logical thing is valuations are going to be different. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean the world has stopped, the technology companies have stopped innovating and disrupting, so that has not stopped. And what we're going to see now is valuations, to me, are an indication of the price of money and the availability of money. And today, there's less money than there was before. Money is more expensive, and therefore, valuations are going to be lower. And as interest rates, you know, in the future will continue to drop, then you will see adjustments in valuation. I don't think we're ever going to get back to the times where money was free, and there was almost an unlimited amount of money. But I think we're going to be getting to a point where, you know, public markets have repriced to 50% yeah. below. Private markets have started to reprice, as you see, the next few rounds. And I think as long as there's innovation and disruption, there is going to be sufficient capital for those great companies. Not all companies qualify, because when you have higher cost of money, not all companies will become profitable. So therefore, it's a smaller pool of investable companies that we will have. But there are great companies in the making. The capital, is it here in the Middle East? Are you raising funds? Are you able to hint at anything that you're currently doing? Because I know you want to expand from the family office space that you have. So what we're doing is we're partnering. I'll tell you, it's the brightest spot to come visit the Middle East. Uh, it's, I call it very similar to the new Silicon Valley from a capital availability. You know, you see tremendous amount of capital outflow from both Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates. And you'd take Abu money Dhabi. from all of those countries? I think what we're doing right now as we're finding these great companies, we're finding individual partnerships with different sovereign funds. And, uh, you know, and, you know, they are incredibly active, but it's also it's so nice to come here, young people, a lot of optimism. It's like a bright spot in a complicated geopolitical world that we live in today. And it's great to come and it's great to see the level of energy and the level of positive people wanting to make an impact on the world. And they're fans of soccer too, or football as I call it, and I know you are too. He was up at three in the morning watching his own team, Bolivian team, Yes. win? 
they won and now we're in the next round of the Champions League of Latin America which is great and for a country like Bolivia that's a big deal because it moves the whole country. We didn't get to talk about football investment we'll do next time I hope. I'm going to be on a panel a little bit later tune in for it. Marcelo Clary is founder and CEO of course the Clary Group. Back to you. Caroline, thank you so much. I can see why he was in such a good mood now. Caroline Hyde there at the Qatar Economic Forum. Now, I want to take you to elsewhere at the forum. Francine Lacqua is in conversation with the IMF Managing Director and the Qatari and Saudi Finance Ministers. Let's listen in. In a fast-changing world, you cannot sit on your successes. You have to work uh, for the future. Thank you so much, Mr. al -Jana. How are you planning? How are you planning to, to spend Saudi Arabia's budget surplus? First of all, let me just uh, <laughs> follow up on uh, Kristalina's uh, last comment. I think we take this very seriously. We are not complacent. We are not going to stop. We are actually looking at every opportunity and using every ammunition that we have to continue this journey. This journey is not going to end in 2030. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an ongoing journey. There are a lot of opportunities that you could really capture and harness. Um, surplus is um, the nature of an economy where you have a fluctuating commodity and your economy dependent on that commodity. So you always have deficits and surpluses and you use your deficits to grow your coffers and use your coffers when the cycle is down so that you could have a sustainable expenditure and not fluctuate, which hurts the economy. Uh, so that's really the short answer. Uh, the longer answer is you need to make sure that you utilize your reserves to mm. produce more. Uh, so uh, by that, A, you need to make sure that it is invested properly, that if you increase your investment, you need to make sure that it increases mm -hmm. in a return that is higher than your investment return. Uh, because they are either investing or borrowing, and you need to make sure that the, you know, the, the outcome of whatever you are spending as government will yield better economic results. We are doing that, uh, and I'm sure the, the GCC countries are moving in that direction, mm -hmm. making sure that really you are spending wisely, you are not spending on a sticky um, uh, expenditure that is very difficult to remove uh, and you are improving the quality of life of people. You need to make sure that you provide better services um, uh, to, to have people enjoy their, their life. Yeah. Mister, there's new research economic from, from Bloomberg Economics that suggests that the true break-even level for Saudi Arabia for the price of oil is $95 a barrel. Is that the case? I don't think in Saudi, definitely we don't discuss actually uh, oil price uh, for a reason. We are a market makers. It's very dangerous really to start talking about um, specific oil price. Understood. Minister, how, how are you spending your budget surplus? And actually, are there any plans to issue debt? Yes. Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, I should thank, you know, Kristalina for the nice words. And, you know, again, I will say, yes, we take or seriously when we are doing good it's worrying us more than when we are doing you know bad so because when you are doing good because it's how we maintain it but i want to say something you know I, yes we have a vision 2030 but there is a one vision it has no end, end date you know this vision is to provide quality for generations and i think this is mm -hmm. something we have to always sustainability of financial system sustainability of economics sustain this is an endless goal you know and and and, and this is a challenge always for us so what we, what we did, you know, here in Qatar, you know, we have developed a, a long-term fiscal policy framework with a very clear mandates how to deal in case of, of surpluses, surpluses. Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua there in a conversation with Kristalina Georgieva, the managing director of the IMF, as well as the Qatari and Saudi finance ministers. You can watch more of that conversation about the Gulf's global competitiveness on Live Go on your terminal. Now, from energy to the travel industry, it's building back up after the tough years of the pandemic. That's one of the key topics at the Qatar Economic Forum. It's one that our very own Manis Cranny has been concentrating, and he's there with a guest. Manis. Danny, I am indeed the CEO of Sebastian Bazin. 
the chairman, the CEO of Accor, in one of his uh, pretty amazing hotels, the Fairmont next door is Raffles. I haven't got the budget for either. Good morning. Good, Good morning. Afternoon. How are you? I'm grand. Listen, this place is full. Yeah. Emirates is full to the brim in business class. So too is Qatar Airways. Are you full to the brim and are you charging to the max for luxury? No, I should be charging even more. Uh, <laughs> But I guess it's been, it's been a good, solid seven months. Uh, again, I've been in the mud for two and a half years, so I'm finally smiling. But it is true that I guess prices went up almost 30% for luxury properties, 10 to 12% for mid-scale properties. But I think we can go more provided we have uh, the service up to it. So my, one of my discussion is uh, labor shortage, but we may go back to this. If I'm paying 30% more, yeah. or perhaps my employer is paying 30% more for me to stay in one of your hotels, what am I getting extra? Am I asking for more? What are you giving me for the 30% extra? Uh, experiences, curation, guide. My, one of the things we changed in the industry, for 20 years I wanted to kidnap you within my property, not for you to go out, for you to have breakfast, dinner, lunch with me, <laughs> which was foolish. Now I want you to go out. So I'm going to be your curator when you go to Doha. That way you go to National Heritage Museums. And I'll be your eyes and you'll be very happy that I get you to remember that Fairmont Raffles have done this for you. So, curation. But that means a very different kind of staff, doesn't it? It's not of just course. one concierge on the front desk. Have you got the talent pool? Do you hire locally? What's the biggest thing to deliver on that product for you? It's uh, the best thing to deliver on it is to turn upside down your thinking. Whatever you build, you design in any new location, build it for the local community. Get them engaged with you from the outside. If they are engaged with you, they're proud to be part of the adventure. All of a sudden, they become the artisan, craftsmanship, the baker. They want to be part of you and the journey with your client. So make it for them as opposed to make it for the travelers. And then it's a win-win scenario. Where is your rev par at the moment? Where is your strongest rev par? Of course, it's the benchmark the market is going to look at. They're going to listen attentively. Uh, Singapore. So Singapore is very strong. Middle East is extremely strong. Surprisingly enough, San Paolo is very strong. And it's been strong for the last year and a half. Don't ask me why, I don't know, but it's been very robust. And then, likely, south of France, uh, we're looking for a great summer uh, in four months from today. Le Côte d'Azur and Le Voile Rouge, I remember them well. Uh, but do you have enough properties in that max luxury segment? Are you, have you got enough capacity? Uh, yeah, we had very little seven years ago. Now we're number two in the world after Myriad. We have a solid 500 luxury, ultra luxury properties. So we're catching up and I think we're going to be the leader in a matter of time. So uh, in South of France, I need more of them. True. So, so there you've heard it. Anybody with a, with a large chateau for Sebastian, get in touch. Because I'm a French guy. It's embarrassing. Okay, well, you should, know, you should know your market know. then. Um, where is the strongest and heaviest demand? Are we traveling again to Asia? It's reopening. Uh, Akbar al Bakr in the seat yesterday. What's your biggest problem in this scaling up and the reopening in China uh, and Asia? No, labor shortage, we think we're fixing it as we speak because we're giving a sense of purpose for people to come back. And there's nothing more rewarding than to be at the service of somebody and to be making a smile on somebody else's face. So that works. In terms of rebound, it is super, super strong. Uh, Southeast Asia has been recovering very fast the last five months. Asia is reopening. China will be the largest hospitality market surpassing the U.S. in a matter of maybe end of the year. Much bigger market than America. People didn't watch out for what's happening 20 years ago in China. They've been accelerating like eight times greater and faster than America. So it's going to be a large market. China is reopening, so which helps me in Southeast Asia, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Burma. That is good. And the rest, my only question is the western north of Europe. So Germany, uh, Holland, Scandix, those are today... Sluggish? Yeah, a bit sluggish because of all called geopolitical uh, problems, of course. So, so we're going to have to respond to this. The rest is just fine. When we caught up a couple of years ago, you said, man, I'm going to hire back everybody that I let go in the pandemic. Have you done that and surpassed that? Where, where are you on the, on the employment trajectory? We, uh, I'll give you a number, which is I didn't even know myself. For the last 12 months, ACO hired 123,000 people. That probably makes us top five in the world of having hired over 100,000 people the last 12 months. The good news, we hired 123,000 people and we give a chance to many of them to find a job in life and I'm super happy about it. Bad news, that means I've lost 100,000 people that I had to replace because our core today is 300,000 people. So 33% turnover, it's challenging. Are you prepared to give them a pay rise? 
It is true. We've been increasing payroll by 7% overall, and in some cases, well above 10%. It is true. And we, you know what? We've been, we've been blind. We probably should have done it a long time ago. Uh, so the question of being get a pay for better service, for less constraint, one of the things we have to do, my, com my business is human capital. So if I don't take care of my own people, they won't be able to take care of others. Commercial property is about to take a hit, they tell me. Yeah. What does that present for you? Is that an opportunity to grab commercial property and convert it? Well, I don't want to grab them, I don't want to lease them, and let alone I don't want to own them. <laughs> okay. But as an asset light operator, I can tell you there's enormous millions of square meters in the world which is today unused. We're probably not great optionalities for the next 24 months. I think we're going to be able to sneak in and offer a hospitality kind of actually product within those uh, commercial facilities for a while. So we, uh, we don't have time now, but I guess we have a concept which is a flat pack and we built a room within 48 hours and we can remove it within 48 hours. Is Noel Quinn knocking on your door? Who's the biggest bank that's talking to you? Thank you. It's actually the big JLL and the uh, Colliers as well. So it's actually done through brokerage houses. So we're sitting in the Fairmont. Um, it's on you are fire. In between Fairmont Raffles. My apologies, so. everybody. No, 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 it's fine. In you are two. exactly in between. Come on. Where is your most expensive suite and is it full all the time? Uh, probably Raffles, Singapore, as we speak. Yeah, but it could be probably, as of last night, it could be actually here. How much are you getting for Raffles in Singapore? For a suite? For the big suite. Probably $35,000. I'm always open to invitation to view. We're not allowed I to can't, accept yet. It's, uh, it's been great to catch up with you. Uh, a full you conversation. So Come back and talk to us soon because, of course, the Middle East is on fire. Part of the reason why you're in Qatar. It's always great to catch up with you. Sebastian uh, Bezan, chairman and CEO of Accor Group here at the Qatar Economic Forum. Danny, I can tell where our next trip is. Sebastian will give us a list <laughs> and uh, I'll share it with you on IB. Danny. Perfect. I'm just saying, you and I would do a great job broadcasting a, a live show from, uh, you know, Raffles, Singapore. I think I think we could really do something there. Man, it's crazy. Sebastian has officially invited us to the opening of the super yacht, <laughs> which is in 2026. You have, haven't you? As you bet it is. It's, uh, it's under construction. We're on that list. There you go. Okay. Two yachts. Two years. So if you miss it in We're 26, free. you'll have it in 27. We're free. Okay. Selling yacht. I fear that. Sailing. <laughs> Sustainable yacht. Sebastian. I fear that might uh, violate a Go few uh, Bloomberg uh, clauses, but, uh, you know, good to get the invitation regardless. Manus, thank you so much, Bloomberg's Manus Cranny there, speaking to the chairman and CEO of Accor. All right, as we get closer uh, to about two hours of cash equity trading here in Europe, it's still the UK gilt market that is under pain this morning. That is the big mover. Here's the jump. You can see that jump right at the open of the market. It was all about inflation coming in hotter than expected. We're seeing two-year gilts. Those yields are higher by about 26 basis points on the day 34. If you're looking there across two days, at what point does this look something more like the LDI panic? It's a bad news day for stocks. That inflation picture really just feeding fuel into the fire of turning more pessimistic. Certainly debt ceiling impasse is not helping in the U.S. All right, that's it for the early edition for this hour, but it continues the next hour with Kriti Gupta and Anna Edwards. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Debt ceiling standoff. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says there's still no deal to avert a U.S. default. A top Republican aide adds that no more meetings are currently planned. UK inflation comes in hotter than expected, with core prices rising at the fastest pace in more than 30 years. The figures escalating bets on further rate hikes from the Bank of England. And we're live once again at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha as the US debt drama and China concerns loom large. Coming up this hour, though, an interview with the CEO of Sotheby's. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. And Kriti, two things driving sentiment for European stocks right now, the debt debate and the debt ceiling standoff over in the United States and the UK inflation impulse, neither of them providing much upside. 
Yeah, I would say something that is kind of bleeding into the American session as well, Anna, this wait and see uh, kind of dynamic. It's interesting that we're kind of seeing that stagnation because I wonder when we do get a result, if indeed it is a positive one, if we do start to see the market surprise to the upside or perhaps plummet even further, uh, there is going to be a lot of debate about simply what the relief rally is or what that even looks like if it indeed is a rally at the end of the day. Because remember, we are still dealing with issues like how tight monetary policy should be, the geopolitics of it all, and of course, the growth story over in the Asia Pacific region. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But for futures at the moment, unchanged, which is essentially, Anna, the sentiment that you were talking about. We are in wait and see mode. 41.56 on futures. And really, it's a significant level because we are kind of bouncing from that 4,200 level day, out, day in, day out. You see those technicals really kind of factoring in in the absence of any real fundamental developments to the positive or uh, to the negative. The two-year yield is getting more interesting as well. 427, you're starting to see volatility creep into the bond market. And of course, as we get closer and closer to that X date uh, from the Treasury, that's really where you're going to see the bond volatility, whereas it feels like equity investors are kind of sitting back and saying, you know what, we're just going to wait this out. Bond markets um, more actively trading the day-to-day -day developments. 427 on the two-year yield, three basis points lower when you look at the front end of the curve. As you see the yield drop, the dollar follows as well. And right now, it's kind of, once again, a tug of war between some of those commodity-exposed currencies, the Canadian dollars, the strength you're seeing there, for example, pulling the dollar in one direction, the euro, the weakness there, pulling it in the other end, basically net-net, and a 1240 on the Bloomberg dollar index, essentially unchanged so far in the session. NYMEX Trude as well, 74 handle, creeping higher, just a little bit more and more, higher by about 1.7%. But again, not something I would write home about just yet. Before we get to the European Check. I want to get a quick check on the Asian markets because, like I said, the idea of the debt ceiling drama kind of taking over Asian and European, uh, excuse me, American and European markets. Well, in Asia, it's a little bit of a different story. They're going back to the growth story, specifically in China. The CSI 300 down 1.4% overnight, Anna, wiping out their 2023 gains. This comes off worries about that economic recovery in the second largest economy in the world. The idea here simply being that the weaker yuan and some of the debt issues with property holders is going to weigh down. Uh, the Chinese economy. A similar sentiment, by the way, weighing on copper as well. This trading on the LME, remember, not futures, the LME contracts. It did drop briefly below 8,000. Again, 8,000 is the level it's flirting with. 8,005 is where we're at right now, but still down about 1.2% in the session. Moving to a different part of the region, we have to talk about the dovish hike coming out of New Zealand. You are starting to see some weakness in uh, the Kiwi here, down about 1.7% on that. What's important to know is that, look, they hiked rates, but they say, hmm, we might not hike again. And the reason for that is simply waiting to see how much of a lag there is when it comes to that monetary policy. Will it catch up in time to really cool inflation, or are they going to have to go further? They're mm. willing to sit back and watch, Anna, rather than be a little bit more aggressive, something we're not hearing necessarily on uh, this side of the Pacific. Yeah, well, a really interesting line coming from the central bank governor saying people are cooling their jets. And as they do that, it seems there's uh, less need then for interest rate hikes. Uh, let's have a look at the European uh, picture then, away from New Zealand and the developments there that certainly uh, were interesting overnight and the weakness in China. This is the European picture. Weakness once again, though, driven by those two factors, really. You can add in China and a little bit of concern there because uh, we are seeing that some of the uh, basic resource stocks are under pressure as a result of the weakness in metals that Chrissy, you were just talking about there. So there's that. There's also the debt debate over in the United States and there's the inflation story here in the UK. So all of that adds up to negativity, in particular in Italy, down by 1.9% on the Italian markets today. Quite volatile there. So this is what we see on a range of UK assets, actually, and also the basic resource stocks. So I'll start at the bottom. That's the mining sector selling off 1.7% uh, weaker as a result of the weakness we're seeing in some of those underlying commodity prices. And all of these three assets have to do with what we've heard on inflation today. So the inflation print, it fell from a double-digit number down to 8.7%. So that is better than uh, than the inflation prints we have been seeing here in the UK. Uh, but it was higher than had been anticipated and the core number giving a lot of people uh, reason for concern. More on, the, di on the, the specifics with Lizzie Burden in a moment. But this is the market reaction. We've seen a big jump, 25 basis points higher in the two-year yield as the market increasingly starts to hype up uh, expectations of where the terminal rate is for the Bank of England. The pound did actually spike up on that sentiment earlier on and then drop back down. It's actually been a negative territory. Uh, so despite the fact markets are pricing in more hikes, uh, the market then starts to ask just how heavy will the Bank of England have to come down on the UK economy to rein in inflation and that has a, a, a negativity for the pound it seems and Taylor Wimpy just an example of one of the house builders Chrissy uh, that is under pressure today down by 5.2 percent as a result of those changing rising expectations of just how high rates go here in the UK.
uh, an interesting dynamic. So many things to factor in, but it still feels like the debt ceiling debate really kind of overshadows all of them. Anna, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, for example, left Capitol Hill yesterday saying the two parties had yet to reach a deal to avert a first ever U.S. default. Here's what some of our guests had to say at the Cutter Economic Forum about the current standoff. I think both sides knows there needs to be a bipartisan deal. It will be a compromise and I think we'll get the debt ceiling raised. No deal gets done until everybody walks away from the table at least once. And so we're doing that in a global environment with a lot of media. But I, I do think sooner or later the debt ceiling will be yesterday's news. Of course we're worried about the debt ceiling, but I heard the reassuring comments both from, uh, from President Biden and Speaker McCarthy yesterday. I, I have to think these guys know uh, what they're playing with. So I, I'm okay on that. My hope is like the other four times that we were in this situation in my lifetime, that we actually stop playing games if we are doing that. I'm not saying that we are, but I do believe that there's a solution in here. And the longer we take to get to it, the worse it's going to be. Joining us now is economy and government editor Jill Desis. Jill, just a day ago, these two sides were saying that talks were productive as Biden returned to Washington. What happened? Where's the hiccup? Yes, well, I think that what we've been seeing is we've been discussing this over the past couple of weeks is that uh, this conversation often whipsaws between, um, you know, what we saw just the other day as Biden was returning to Washington from Japan, where you've got him and McCarthy saying everything's productive, we're making some progress. Um, you know, maybe the tone has shifted a little bit there uh, to what you're seeing today, which is not uh, dissimilar from what we saw over the weekend, where these major negotiators are getting together and saying there's still some major impasses that we've reached that we have to go over. I do think that what is notable, and um, you mentioned this earlier in this program, but um, there's no current meetings that are scheduled uh, to line up after this two-hour meeting at the Capitol between negotiators on both sides. So we're going to have to continue to see what's happening there, but it's looking more and more like we might not have anything until sort of an 11th hour deal as we're approaching that June 1st deadline. Mm, yes, the 11th hour deal. It's just uh, some people are not entirely sure where the where midnight is, are they? So that's difficult. Uh, is there any room then with that in mind, uh, Jill, for a compromise? I mean, a, a lot of things need to happen even after agreement is achieved between the leaders. Yes, Anna. Well, look, I think that at this point, we still know that there is a lot of daylight between these two sides. Uh, Republicans don't want any cuts to defense spending. That's obviously where the Democrats are. Um, what the Republicans want is they want to consider trims to social services programs, domestic spending. Uh, so this is, um, you know, sort of a time old argument when it comes to these two sides. And they're going to have to work out some kind of compromise as we get closer. But yes, as you mentioned, uh, there's still a little bit of debate over um, where exactly that 11th hour, that midnight deadline is. Uh, you have had some Republicans question uh, um, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's assessment that it, it's really June 1st. So ultimately, I think we're going to continue to see this develop. Um, as we've seen every day, we wake up to some new kind of development in terms of whether there's progress or that there's not. So we'll just have to see what the coming days have for us. And some even arguing that then you have to bake into the idea, the lag of just how much the actual wording is going to take to write it. So perhaps is the X date actually way earlier for markets uh, than we previously thought? Bloomberg's Jill Deeses, we thank you as always for walking us through that story. From the Washington drama to perhaps the UK drama, UK inflation was hotter than expected last month with services and core prices rising at the fastest pace. And get this, over 30 years. Let's dig deeper with Lizzie Burden, our UK correspondent. Lizzie, how how do we interpret the data? What's the BOE thinking here? Well, Kriti, it's bad news for the BOE, just as it is for households and the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Yes, inflation in the UK is back in single digits, but it beat all expectations from economists, including the Bank of England. So it raises questions about their models, their economic forecasts, which the Bank of England chief economist, Hugh Pill, himself raised in Parliament yesterday. The Governor, Andrew Bailey, uh, said the problem has been assuming that inflation would fall as fast as, it's, as it rose, and it hasn't. If you break it down, the fall is almost entirely accounted for by base effects. So this time last year, you saw energy prices, ri energy bills rising by nearly 50 percent. That uh, is stripped out in the annual comparison. Then if you look at food prices, yes, they tick down, but they're still at a near record high, which is especially harmful for the poorest Brits. And then if you put food and energy price inflation to the side, and as you say, look at core inflation, 
inflation. That was expected to hold steady, and yet it rose, which is really the signal of the stickiness of this price growth. That's what's going to worry the Monetary Policy Committee. That's why traders are now pricing for peak rates of 5.5%. And you have to ask, will the Bank of England actually breach that 5% ceiling? Yeah, so a lot of people thinking just how high will rates go now in the UK with the stickiness of inflation. Now, away from the very here and now and thinking about the future of UK politics, Lizzie, you've been speaking to the UK shadow chancellor. Many would uh, think of her as a chancellor in waiting, given the latest electoral polling in the UK suggests that the Labour Party are doing pretty well. Um, so what were your main takeaways from your conversation with her? Yeah, it might seem counterintuitive, but in order to become the party of business, which is what the Conservatives like to call themselves, she wants to take a more activist, interventionist approach, what she calls Securonomics. Take a listen. Securonomics is an approach that builds on the contributions of more people in more parts of Britain and with a, a more secure national economy, uh, taking advantage of some of the big opportunities, but also ensuring our resilience, our strength and our security to give families that security that they are desperately crave right now. So that contrasts with the government's warnings about getting into a subsidy race with other G7 nations in response to Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. But this is Labour setting out its economic plan in the US. Significant that Rachel Reeves should choose to uh, make this announcement there, uh, but perhaps significant signifying uh, how she wants to work with international partners. So that's, of course, on the government front. Let's stick with the anti-regulatory, or I should say anti-antitrust, whatever you want to call it, piece of the equation. In the UK, the CMA accusing traders at five major banks of colluding in chat rooms to swap sensitive information on UK bonds. What exactly are the allegations here? Well, Kriti, uh, the banks involved are Citigroup, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, Morgan Stanley and RBC. Each, uh, the, the CMA says, unlawfully shared details on pricing and trading strategies in chat rooms between 2009 and 2013, specifically about guilt and guilt asset swaps. Now, the problem is, by sharing sensitive information with com competitors, the banks could have prevented the full benefits of competition with anyone they traded with. So that could be pension funds to taxpayers. In terms of the punishment, Deutsche has owned up to it first, so they're not going to be fined. City admitted to the collusion, so it's getting a discounted fine. And for the rest of the banks, they haven't admitted any wrongdoing. So at this point, important to say, we cannot assume that any of them have broken the law. Lizzie, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden with a host of uh, stories making the headlines here in the UK. Now it is day two of the Qatar Economic Forum. It's underway in Doha. The chairman of Rubini Ma uh, Macro Assembly Associates, who is best known for his predictions of economic doom, has been speaking with Bloomberg and uh, this uh, with Bloomberg this morning. Manus Granny joins us now on the ground in Doha. Manus, Rubini warned that talks to avoid a US default could drag on, but that wasn't all he said. No, it wasn't. I mean, it's almost like Brexit talks, Anna, isn't it? We're going into the tunnel. We are in the tunnel of the debt talks, and the risk is that there is a misstep, and that could be toxic for the dollar. It could lead to de-dollarization. That is what people are talking about. But, of course, we're so far away from that being a reality. I bumped into him a little bit earlier on, and I said, are you still spreading the, the doom, gloom, and bust? He said, no, man. He said, I'm talking about reality. And the reality is that geopolitics at a global level, he's just come back from Israel, Israel, Iran, but, of course, it is about the West's ganging up on China that's perhaps top of the agenda for Nouriel. After the G7 Hiroshima summit, I would say there's not going to be any thaw between U.S. and China. The Chinese reaction to this G7 summit is that European U.S. and Japan and others are ganging up against China. So this yeah. cold war between U.S. and China is going to get colder. And that Cold War, that ganging up, is only going to become a little bit more toxic. Now, and that has got ramifications, both in terms of the commodity market. Just think to yourself, Israel, Iran, if there was a conflict, China, US, if the conflict mines, that's a trade angst along with commodity angst. And those are the two biggest warnings that came out of that conversation a little bit earlier in the day. And if you're hoping for rate cuts, jog on. I think would be the message from Nuro Rubini. That is an aggressive paraphrase uh, on his overall arching theme on rates. Anna, pretty. <laughs> uh, I'll take it from here. Manis, 
all-star lineup at the Qatar Economic Forum. What else do you have coming up? A little bit later on, we're going to catch up with the CEO of Sotheby's. We've just come off the New York art sales. Kriti, uh, as you know there, were there cracks in the wall there? How much is your watch collection worth? Uh, we know that on Poshco, on your Bloomberg terminal, you can sell your average Patek Philippe. Uh, but there are some pretty special pieces coming up for auction. Charles Stewart uh, joins me on TV and on the podium. I'll also debate the future of capitalism with the CEO of MasterCard. I bumped into him in the hotel last night. He was on his way out the door. We had a brief moment together. I said, I hope you've schooled up on capitalism and the definition of that. We just heard from Al Jadan, the Saudi finance minister. We're going to continue those conversations through the afternoon here at the Qatar Economic Forum. I've got to say, the atmosphere here is pretty electric. The group of people they've brought together, just like Sebastian Bazin. Anna, pretty, you'll be glad to know. We're off on a super yacht in 2026. Good morning from Qatar. Oh, I already heard you invite Danny, so we're not coming, Manus. Uh, thanks very much, Manus Karani, uh, with us from Doha. Um, uh, we'll all go. Wonderful. Uh, we, uh, we will be back with Manus later. Just to get to some headlines to you, where a red headline across the Bloomberg terminal says that EU banks are said to sail through an early round of stress tests. And diving deeper into this story, many large European banks, according to our colleagues, are emerging from early rounds of key stress tests, prompting some regulators to question whether to push harder at a time when investors are focused on the industry's resilience. We had headlines around this yesterday as well, suggesting that the ECB is still considering whether it wants to make further, for example, liquidity requirements of banks. So interesting to watch all the ways that the uh, regulators are keeping the banking sector safe in Europe. Coming up on the programme, Lenovo posting its first quarterly profit miss in more than six years as the industry struggles with slowing PC demand. We will speak to the CFO of Lenovo next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Now, shares of Lenovo had their biggest drop since 2021 after the company posted its first quarterly profit miss in more than six years. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say, is Wang Wai-Ming, uh, the CFO and Executive Vice President at Lenovo. Uh, Wai-Ming, nice to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. It seems then that you've missed estimates in terms of quarterly profit in the fourth quarter. How sluggish is demand? How subdued is demand for PCs right now? Uh, I think, well, two things I want to clarify. I think in terms of the, uh, I think, market estimate, uh, the market obviously do not make any estimate on the provision of our restructuring expenses. Uh, and hence, if you actually put the restructuring expenses that we actually uh, I, I think we reported back, to, uh, and, and then you will see that we're actually, I think, well within range or even maybe above the average. Now, on the revenue, I think we are within range and we are just about, I think, at the market estimate. So that's really one point of clarification. Uh, secondly, in terms of, uh, I think, the market demand, uh, I think we, based on the uh, market data that we have, uh, meaning that apart from looking at the shipment data, which obviously provide both third party, uh, we also look at the underlying market demand, meaning that when some, when a customer is actually, well, uh, again, uh, most, uh, some of the sort of products that we sell, sell to distributors, the distributor put it in the channel, uh, put it in the warehouse, and when there is a demand, they actually sell it to customers. The real demand and therefore when customer buys a PC, they will activate and what we call the activation rate. We actually have, uh, I think, based on our own data, I think the mark, our activation rate, I think, is actually even higher than the pre-COVID level. Now, why would I think the shipment data or the shipment volume is, is lower than the acti activation data? Is because during the COVID period, uh, many mm. ch channel partners uh, because of COVID-19, because of supply, I think the uncertainty of logistic, supply component shortage, they actually buy a lot more. And now the market obviously okay. softened. I know I'm not suggesting the market has been growing. And therefore, this is the period uh, we see that I think the channel are digesting the inventory. And based on the activation rate, I think we are reasonably confident that the market will actually, uh, I think, come back.
OK, so, so uh, important to get your take on how you've performed against uh, your, your expectations. Um, thinking about where the shipping rate is and the activation rate then, uh, Waiming, how, how long will we be dealing with this inventory overhang, if you like, in, in, the, uh, in the full supply chain? Hmm. Yeah, I think we actually see that so sort of inventory digestion, uh, not just Lenovo, but the industry, uh, probably happen maybe two, three quarters. Uh, we've, we're actually reasonably confident that I think the channel inventory, uh, uh, I think, will probably be clear, uh, probably by most players, or the market will clear the channel inventory, I think, by another, well, I think in the second quarter of our, of our fiscal year, meaning that I think our quarter two. Uh, we def, uh, we are re at the moment, our view is in the second half of the year, we actually will see the, uh, a, a slow growth of the business. Now, I think two things that you should bear in mind when you actually look at growth rate, because you're actually comparing the, the, the year before. Now, Q1 and Q2, meaning April to June quarter, April to, sorry, April to September, the two quarters last year, I think the PC is still growing very, very, very much because I think if I remember, I think we still continue to see hitting, I think, historic, uh, I think, record, uh, I think, business in those two quarters. And then the market actually come down significantly in starting from the October quarter and obviously the last quarter. So we actually see that the, the decline, like sort of 20, 20 something percent, right. uh, I think, happened in the October to December quarter as well as January to March. So the second half of this year, we obviously will be comparing with a more reasonable base and looking at the activation data, and that is where we actually derive our confidence that the market will get back right. to more normal. Because, as, as I said, the fundamental uh, uh, belief of the fundamental issue that uh, the fundamental data that we look at is really the activation data. I think the activation demand is even higher than the pre-COVID-19 well, level. Well, Waiming, of one of the, the key themes in the last couple of quarters, as you mentioned, is the development of open AI specifically. Now, talk to us a little bit about Lenovo's plans, especially when it comes to perhaps boosting server <laughs> sales, or is the focus, on the other hand, more in the smartphone business? How do you square the two? Uh, well, I think two things. The AI, obviously, is the technology that actually gives I think the world, in fact, I think the more consumption of IT, uh, no matter this is a device or this is infrastructure, sometimes the, the market actually think that AI will actually benefit uh, just the infrastructure. I think our view is, you have, uh, I think customers need to have a device to leverage uh, the AI. Uh, and smartphone is really part of our devices. I think that's the whole philosophy that we did our restructuring two years ago by really putting all the device called uh, IDG, intelligent device, so that the device will interact, I think, with the end customers and then be able to leverage the, uh, the new technology such as AI. And then that actually will require a lot more compute capability and that also benefit, I think, the other activity of our group. So I actually would not look at just a smartphone or PC, it's really the intelligent device. And today, when you actually look at Lenovo, I think our PC business only account for maybe like 60% of our revenue. I think we actually been diversifying not only on the device side, but also in terms of, I think the non-device side accounting for nearly like 40% of our business. Certainly something we're gonna be keeping an eye on. Lenovo's Wang Wei Ming, we are thrilled to have you. Thank you as always for your time and your insights. Coming up on the show, we're gonna to speak to Janet Mui, head of market analysis over at RBC Bruin Dolphin. A lot to digest here. How do you price in the debt ceiling? How do you price in the geopolitics? And of course the Chinese growth story as well, which seemingly in this side of the Atlantic and Pacific is kind of getting overshadowed by what's going on in Washington. We're gonna dive into all of it. Stick with us, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. The debt ceiling standoff. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says there's still no deal to avert a U.S. default. Top Republican aide adds that no more meetings are planned. U.K. inflation comes in hotter than expected, with core prices rising at the fastest pace in more than 30 years. The figures escalating bets on further rate hikes from the Bank of England. 
And we're live again from the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha as the U.S. debt drama and China concerns loom large. Coming up this hour, an interview with the CEO of Sotheby's. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Look, Anna, it is all about the debt ceiling this side of the Atlantic, this side of the Pacific, but it's hard to deny that there are more things hanging over this market, things like geopolitics, things like the China growth story, mm. and then, of course, kind of reverting back to the inflationary story that has really dominated markets for the past two years. Yeah, the sticky inflation story is still front and center here in the UK, but all of those other things in the mix then, Chrissy, and all of that adds up to a weakness on European stocks, down by 1.5%. So actually weakening as we go through the session. All sectors in Europe are in negative territory, uh, and many of them, nearly all of them, down by 1% or more. So we do see weakness across European equity markets, and it is pretty broad-based. We have the debt ceiling debate. We have the US inflation concerns. We also have China slowdown, all of that taking its toll. Onto the UK side of things, and we've got that inflation print that, yes, came down from above 10% to somewhere in the mid-8, 8, uh, eight plus, but that so it is single digit, and that's the positive side of things, coming in at 8.7%. But still, the core inflation number jumped, and that was unexpected. And that just shows how sticky, how pervasive the inflation impulse is in the UK and the hard job that the Bank of England might have ahead of it. So we saw, as a result, a repricing of expectations around the terminal rate. So the uh, two-year yield jumps by 25 basis points on UK gilt. So that makes sense entirely. The pound also jumped in early trade, and that seemed to make sense if you're pricing in more rate hikes from the Bank of England. But what toll will that take on the UK economy? Economy, just how much will those, uh, will, how far will the Bank of England have to go to bring down inflation? And that was weighing on traders' minds, perhaps, as they saw that spike in the pound and then sold it, sold it down back to 124 and into negative territory. This is the impact of the China story then. So uh, basic resource is not the worst performing sector today, but it is linking into that global theme. Weakness in commodity prices is weighing on some of those basic resources, those mining stocks here in the UK. Actually, the weakest performing sector, though, travel and leisure, as we see those energy prices go higher, Chrissy. And I think that weakness that you're seeing in the European session, Anna, 100% seeping into the U.S. session. You're already seeing in the last 30 minutes, future stateside have come down a little bit. Look, they're not selling off uh, with a massive momentum or massive conviction just yet, but you are seeing futures worsening a little bit. We were unchanged about 30 minutes ago, now down about two-tenths of 1%. So you can really see uh, how that global sentiment is, again, seeping into the U.S. session. The two-year yield at 428, though, interesting to see that that's really where things stay stagnant. The narrative you are hearing overnight, the kind of stagnation in those debt ceiling talks. It's showing up in the bond market lower by about three basis points on the front end of the curve, taking with it, by the way, the Bloomberg dollar index in the absence of any positive or negative fundamental news for the dollar specifically. Again, as we wait for those debt ceiling developments, you do see it kind of in a tug of war between the Canadian dollar and the euro right now, the largest and uh, kind of weight and uh, tailwind on, on both ends. So again, a tug of war for the greenback there. NYMEX crude, though, is trading with a 74 handle. This is interesting because even as you have sentiment worsening and the idea of Chinese growth worsening, NYMEX crude actually higher on the day, which kind of brings into question what kind of dislocation is in the commodity market right now if they're not all trading the same. A 74 handle, Anna, higher by about 2% there. OK, let's talk about the uh, deliberations that we're seeing taking place in Washington and what impact that could have on the market then, Chrissy. Nuria Rabini is warning that talks to avoid a U.S. default could drag on with failure to agree on a debt ceiling likely to hit markets and damage confidence in the dollar. He spoke earlier at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. The Chinese definitely want to increase the role of the RMB. If the U.S. were to have a real problem with debt, with a credit event and so on, that's going to increase the likelihood that the people are going to diversify over time away from dollar assets. We don't know yet. Uh, they may get uh, to the last hour before there's an agreement, or it's possible they don't reach an agreement. If that doesn't happen, then the market is going to crash, and that may force an agreement in the next few days. Let's get the perspective now from Janet Mui, Head of Market Analysis at RBC Bruin Dolphin. She joins me on set here in London. Janet, good to speak to you this morning. So Nuriel Rubini says, if there is no deal, we get a market crash, that focuses minds. Do you, are you bracing for this, that to be the way that things play out? Hi, uh, good morning, Anna. Thanks for having me. Well, we think it's, it's very hard to predict what will happen, but we still think that the chance of a US default is very slim. Uh, we still think that there is a path to a deal. Um, before the, the potential event. Uh, but what we think is that the market is currently pretty complacent. We have seen that play out a decade before. You know, there, there has to be some market pressure 
for a deal to be through, but we don't see that yet. You know, equities are pretty sanguine at the moment. Right. So we think that there could be more market volatility going into next week sometime, but we think eventually a deal would be pushed through. Right, and we did see a bit of negativity yesterday in European, st in uh, sorry, stocks and in uh, in risk assets, but yes, your point is, is of course, longer term, it does seem as if stocks have been pretty complacent, whereas maybe short-end treasuries, T-bills have reacted. With all of that in mind, if we get a deal, do we get a bounce in stocks? Because some people say, yeah, of course we will because it removes a, a key question. Others will say no because some liquidity will come out of stocks and go into T-bills mm -hmm. and actually it'll be a sign that we're getting fiscal retrenchment in the United States. How does all that play for you? Uh, I think, uh, first of all, as market is complacent, I think most people actually ultimately expects a deal. So I think there may well be a relief rally because this is a removal of uncertainty, but I don't think it will be a huge rally because I think this is somewhat expected. Um, to your point about uh, increased supply in TBOs, yeah, potentially um, that actually could withdraw liquidity from the system. And I think, you know, if we do get a deal, ultimately some form of spending cuts will be involved, right? It's a matter of which part uh, they're going to cut. So there would be uh, some cuts which will be negative for the economy overall. So if you throw in the stress of the banking system, uh, tightening credit conditions, and you throw in some more additional spending cuts, we think yeah. ultimately that will be negative for the economy. So that actually could pr put pressure on the equities. Janet, talk to us a little bit about the debt ceiling debate in the context of weakness you're seeing in China. I want to say about a year ago when the property sector story in China really developed, it tanked markets globally. We're seeing it kind of rear its ugly head again, and it's not having the same effect. Is this a dislocation? Well, I, I, first of all, I think that the China reopening story, uh, I think everyone appreciates now that it is a consumer-driven recovery. So the things that are traditional growth drivers like the fixed investment, the property, manufacturing, they're really lagging. So I think now markets appreciate it's not broad based. It's not as good as people have previously anticipated. Certainly not any more stimulus expected from the authorities for now. I think uh, monetary policy, fiscal policy, pretty conservative uh, because they are very likely to hit the growth target. So I think uh, it, it is uh, probably right the Chinese market is not advancing because there's still so much structural concerns for investors. So that puts a lot of people on the sidelines. Well, in the absence of that stimulus from China and in the absence of the relief rally uh, that you suggest after this debt ceiling debate is over, what kind of downside risk are we looking at? Put some numbers on it for us. Yeah, so right now we're defensively positioned. We have been cautious because we expect you know, a U.S. recession. We do push back the date of that U.S. recession now to 2024, but we think that's inevitable given the tightening in credit conditions. Primarily, the interest rates will stay high in the U.S. contrary to what the market is currently pricing. Um, so I think that itself is negative for the economy, negative for corporate profits. I mean, so far corporate profits holding up pretty well, but eventually corporates will face more margin pressure. So um, we think ultimately this will drag the equity markets lower. And of course, we had this rally already year to day. As I said, equities are very complacent at the moment. Uh, if you throw in a bit of uh, extra stress, I, I do think that the markets will, will be a bit more uh, vulnerable. Mm. Okay, thanks very much, Janet. Thanks for joining us. Janet Mui of RBC Bruin Dolphin. Coming up on the program, we'll get back to Qatar, to the economic forum taking place there in Doha. We'll be joined by the Sotheby's CEO, Charles Stewart. He'll be talking to Manus Granny on the ground. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later this morning, interviews with BNY Mellon's Jeff Yu, Wells Fargo's Darrell Cronk, and Liz Young over at SoFi. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. People have to just listen to themselves and what they respond to because uh, you know, art can be anything. It doesn't require anything. Uh, you don't have to know about anything. You just have to come to it with your past experiences. That was the acclaimed American artist Jeff Kuhn speaking with Francine Lacroix at the Qatar Economic Forum. Uh, welcome back to the program. Let's get back to Doha with Boomberg's Manus Cranny, who's joined by the Sotheby's CEO, Charles Stewart. Manus. Anna, thank you very much. We have Charles Stewart in the seat. I'm going to kick off with a tangent. We've got Louis Vuitton tanking along with 
you know, Hermes and these super luxury brands, they're really concerned about China. Have you anything that you can add to this story in terms of the auction house? Are you seeing cracks in global luxury or is it just a different part of the market you deal with? Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think it's a different part of the market. Uh, we're actually seeing Chinese uh, buyers emerging post-pandemic to participate in, in our global sales, but also in Hong Kong. In fact, uh, last month in Hong Kong, we had our largest sale of Chinese works of art in nine years, which I attribute to Chinese coming back to the global markets. Also remember that we are at the very high end of the luxury markets as well, which is perhaps a bit more insulated. You're just coming off the New York art sales. Um, I am far from an aficionado, but there were some stunning pieces that went out. People are saying that overall, $1.7 billion was done in the art sales in the week. Now that was materially less than we saw last year. Mm. What does that drop in value of sales say to you about your market? Well, actually, I thought the, the markets and the sales were quite resilient. Um, 1.7, 1.8 billion is pretty good by any sort of historical comparison for a, for a, a week of, of art sales. There were many artists records set. Uh, for sure, we're feeling to some extent the uh, uncertainty and the you know, macro outlook weighs a bit on the markets. But I think overall what we saw were uh, real money, real collectors, and very strong overall sell-through rates in the art sales. You meet the super rich, you talk to them, they come in quietly, discreetly to look at yes. things that they want to buy. Are they becoming more discerning, if that's the right word, are they becoming more judicious about the pieces that they will go for? Is there a shift in any way? Well, one thing I, th I think we did see last week was a bit of differentiation between what I would call the very fresh, very rare A-plus works. They did exceptionally well, and works that maybe are less rare or have traded more recently uh, or are B-plus or, or lesser works by a given artist, uh, those did less well. Um, but absolutely, our client base um, was incredibly global, incredibly sophisticated, and um, I think there's a high degree of confidence in, uh, in art as a store of value, of course, in addition to people's collecting passions. Switch over to hard luxury. I mean, I'm at the much lower end of the yes. market, so I just sort of troll through the website and have a look at the sort of the odd, the odd watch yes. that I might be able to afford. But on that point, I mean, the crypto crowd have taken a bruising, the second-hand yes. watch market is on fire, but it's coming off in pricing. What can you tell me about that market? Our audience are watch fans. They sure. troll for watches, they build collections. Where's the pricing? Right. And where, you know, where's the secret sauce in watches? Yeah, where, where we saw the effect of all of the stimulus and perhaps a crypto effect, faster money coming into markets, was at the very new end of certain luxury markets, be it watches or certainly cars, hypercars, supercars, and the prices have adjusted there. They're still meaningfully above the primary uh, market prices, so good luck uh, queuing up for the really hot uh, Pectep Philippe, Petek Philippe and getting it primary. That's not happening. It's the same in, in handbags, same in watches, uh, same in cars. Are they just constraining supply? Is that bolstering the market? Do you, do you feel that that's underpinning the market? I, I think that scarcity is, is, is clearly a key driver of a lot of these markets, including art, by the way. But in hard luxury, uh, the manufacturers, um, in, in my view, have been very judicious about you know, trying to calibrate that supply and demand equation. We have a thousand directions that we can go in and time is limited. You'll be with me on a panel a little bit later on. We can talk about Generation X yes. and how you're hooking them. But I am absolutely transfixed by Freddie Mercury's sale. It's coming yes. up later in the year. I look back, David Bowie, the first night of his sale for art was 30 million bucks. Yes. Tell me this, what's going to fly from Freddie's yeah. collection? What is it that just stands out here? What do you think yeah. we're going to make on Freddie's collection? You know, it's, it's hard to say the audience reaction to the announcement um, on our website and our traffic and anticipation for the physical exhibitions has been extraordinary and overwhelming. We're incredibly excited. The sales are in early September in London. There are hundreds and perhaps thousands of personal effects belonging to Freddie Mercury, including many, many iconic, <laughs> iconic uh, bits of, um, of things he wore in special moments, um, instruments that he were quite important in the, in the, in the, in the music he wrote. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a, a cultural phenomenon. I, you know, and I'm just curious, that is gonna take place, as you say, in London. Do you think post-pandemic, for this auction, for example, coming up, are the ones that you've just seen, are we seeing less online and more physical, or no right. manus actually? The online is resilient, it's strong, I've not seen any material shift in the bidding at the sure. global auctions. 
You know, before the pandemic, about 40% of all of the bids that we took were placed using our app or, or our, our website. Now it's over 90%. Um, and that, that was a phenomenon of the pandemic as well as our investment in innovation and technology. And that has stuck post-pandemic. So for our biggest live sales, um, people are bidding in person or on the phone. Um, but for most of our sales, certainly including the Freddie Mercury sales, I expect to see very heavy bidding online and on, and on our app as well. So you're in a very rarefied world. What's the most gorgeous thing that you've treated yourself to at auction? <laughs> Come on, spell. How much have you spent? What's the maximum and most beautiful thing you've bought at an auction? Well, I must say, um, coming to work every day, I walk up the stairs, and yeah. there's, you fall in love every day with something you didn't quite know. We had an Aboriginal art sale, Oceanic Art, last week with some absolutely beautiful pieces in it. Um, luxury week this week. Um, there's a 55 carat ruby as well as a 10 carat pink, vivid, fancy pink diamond, which is quite extraordinary. Many of the things that I love the most, I can't afford. And one of the, uh, yet, and one of the, um, uh, one of the rules of collecting is you have to love it. Uh, you also have to be able to afford it. And you have to have done enough work to understand its significance and importance. At 35 million bucks for the pink diamond, the eternal pink diamond. I think I might be waiting a long time before I can even countenance thinking about it. You never know. You're doing well. Charles, we'll see you inside. We're going to talk about how to keep Gen X on side in the auction world. Ladies of London and New York, there you go. This is the CEO. He's got a couple of diamonds and the odd ruby on sale in the next month. There you go. The bidding starts here. Manus, thank you very much. Maybe that's Manus Cranny with Sotheby's CEO Charles Stewart at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. You know, so whatever happens with the debt ceiling and T-bills, there's always art, watches and diamonds. Coming up on the programme, retail earnings continue with coal set to report before the US market open. We'll get a preview next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Now let's take a look at some of the things that are ahead for us today. Uh, Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey is speaking at 9 a.m. Eastern time. We've already got the, a few headlines from what he's going to be talking about on the climate today. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen speaking at 10 a.m. That'll be crucial in the debt conversations, of course, the debt ceiling. Then we'll hear from Fed Governor Christopher Waller at 12 p.m. noon. And that will be followed by remarks from ECB President Christine Lagarde in Frankfurt. And finally, FOMC meeting minutes come out at 2 p.m. We haven't mentioned that yet, Chrissy. Something is amiss. <laughs> uh, I wonder how much of, again, all of these other geopolitics, the Fed, et cetera, just kind of falls behind when it comes to the debt ceiling. It's just overtaken everything, even some of the key uh, kind of micro market stories, Anna, which brings me to some of the stocks that we're watching in the pre-market this morning, because look, earnings are still afloat. We're going to get to that. But one of the major movers in the last couple of sessions has been Moderna shares. A little bit of deja vu here. We're talking about this global pandemic being over, but it's not over in every part of the world. China, like you see its COVID wave peaking at about 65 million infections a week toward the end of June. That coming from a senior health advisor in China, pushing those Moderna shares higher, higher by about 2.6%. Do you also, again, like I said, have those earnings stories seeping back in? Palo Alto, the cybersecurity firm, defying the macroeconomic background. Get this, a triple whammy. They raised guidance on their profit revenue, their billings for the fiscal year, and their full year outlook. So really good news out of there. Shares higher by just shy of 5%. And after the bell, Anna, we get NVIDIA shares, the heavyweight in the S&P 500, already a little bit of pessimism baked into that stock, down about eight-tenths of 1% in the pre-market after their data center unit could could not show whether or not cloud computing companies are splurging on that AI infrastructure. But, of course, in the near term, we have a really big retail name reporting. Kohl's reporting its first quarter results later today. Ahead of the opening bell stateside, its moves to reduce inventory may not be enough for the retailer. Joining us now to break it all down, Bloomberg's Simone Foxman. Simone, walk us through what we should expect here. Kind of mixed messages from last week's earnings. Yeah, well, we got a taste of what's happening with big box retail. This is our taste of what has happening with department stores. And Kohl's is one of these high yield names, two downgrades last month, mostly on concerns about uh, its leverage overall. Uh, five year CDS at 846 basis points. It had a terrible 2022. It built up a ton of inventory by 40%. What we're going to be watching for is how it's starting to eliminate that 
that inventory uh, as, as you suggested. Yes, it's had higher footfall that we've seen from some of the high frequency data, but maybe that's just because it's trying to discount its products and get its stuff out mm. the door. Um, analysts have a really mixed message on where we go from here. Uh, can it pull through as it tries to deleverage? Okay, so that's one of the things we're watching for then in terms of inventories, Simone. What are the other trends that we're going to be focused on today when it comes to uh, Coles and other retail names? Yeah, overall, we should look at this as our first taste of what's going to happen to department stores, Macy's, Nordstrom's, expected next week. And all of these names have been under a great deal of pressure. Coles specifically trying to bulk up uh, its out of mall, indoor mall uh, sort of offerings. But I think, you know, we should reference the luxury story. We've seen that sell off in European luxury names because we're also going to see how consumers are going to apparel names. And some of the same factors are at play. Do we see the weakening of the U.S. consumer? We're looking at Abercrombie and Fitch this morning, American Eagle and Guest this afternoon. In most of those, we expect to see sales rise just a tad, but we've seen this sell off in Europe, mainly based on the U.S consumer can Chinese consumers kind of pull things through in some of these brands I think that's the big question we're going to be asking today and the rest of this week Simone thanks very much Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg Simone Foxman there with the latest on the retail space and and Critty, uh, thinking about the interesting signals we're getting on US retail it's having an impact on luxury here in Europe we heard Manus Cranny talking about it earlier uh, incredible amounts knocked off luxury names yesterday in Paris as a result of declining expectations for US consumers and uh, and the luxury spending yeah and I think it's a key thing what Simone just said can the Chinese consumer make up for the lack of US consumer that's gonna be something to watch for sure certainly is. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. They'll be speaking to BMY Mellon's Jeff Yu, Wells Fargo's um, uh, Wells Fargo uh, voices will be with them, as will voices from SoFi. Lots to think about as we get uh, more news lines surrounding the debt ceiling. This is Bloomberg.